Today, we last class we did the Epicureans, the Stoics, and the Neoplatonists. But I jumped from like 300 BCE to 300 AD is where Plotinus was. And so I just did it because I thought they went nicely together and they all three of those philosophies had such a huge impact on the Roman Empire and then later on Western philosophy. I want to kind of fill in that that 600 year period for you today though, a little bit of what was going on. And notably, we had the advent of Christ, Jesus of Nazareth being born, and I already mentioned somewhere between 8 and 4 BC, and that had to do with messing up the numbers, not some other miracle how Jesus was born before he was born. Okay, so that's not what I'm saying. But during that time period, the Roman Empire, you know, there's a lot of contact now with Parthia, which is modern day Persia or Iran, all the way to India. You have this influx of ideas, different views. The Epicureans and Stoics have a huge foothold in philosophy. We had the Hellenization of the ancient Mediterranean world take place under Alexander the Great. So you got all this Greek culture and influence. And we even see that in the New Testament, right, among the early church. There were Hellenized Jews and then Jews that kept more to their traditional culture and ethnicity and religion. And there was a conflict even in the early church between Jews that were, you could say, secularized or Hellenized, humanized, and those that were still trying to adhere to the Old Testament, things like that. And that's one of the divisions you see between the Sadducees and the Pharisees. The Pharisees were like first century fundamentalists. They took scripture seriously. They believed in its authority. They were trying to keep every jot and tittle. I mean, these people were even tithing their spices. Can you imagine Sunday morning you go to your herb ca cabinet and you take 10% of your cumin and your thyme and your rosemary and you bring that into the priest? I mean, they had it down to every, just every little detail. But the Sadducees, they had been appointed by their Greek overlords. Alexander the Great upon his death, and this is really interesting if you look at the prophecies in Daniel. I'm going to talk about Daniel a little bit today. But Daniel prophesied about this, this wild ram coming from the north, but he only had one horn. But he was able to drive out the two-horned ram, which represented the Medes and the Persians, right? That was the great empire that Alexander destroyed, that double-horned ram. And the Greek single horn ram of Alexander comes in, overthrows the two horn ram, but then that one horn is replaced by four little horns. And if you know your ancient history, Alexander upon his death did not have an heir, or if he did, he wasn't able to come to power. And so his kingdom or empire was split up between four generals. And the two that are gonna play into a lot of what I'm talking about today were the Ptolemies in Egypt and the Seleucids in Syria, and they were at conflict. And Palestine, of course, is right between the two. And so the Sadducees were actually, well, lackeys, basically. They were set up by the Greeks to keep control. They were Jewish people, but they were ruling under the Greek authority and influence. And so you have that interesting dynamic, and you can see why there was so much animosity and hate between the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Because a lot of the Sadducees, you see that conflict that Paul utilizes where he brings up the resurrection of the dead because these Hellenized Jews did not believe in it just like the materialistic Greeks believed you're born, you live, you die, it's over. What, what time period did Alexander the Great die and like the four nations came into power? We're talking um, fourth century, like I think early 300s, but if someone wants to Google exactly, but we're talking somewhere around 300 BC. And it it's, cracks me up when Christians talk about the 400 years of silence. It would be better to say 400 years where we do not have canonized scripture because we certainly know a ton of what was going on during this time period from extra biblical writings, even the Apocrypha, if you're familiar with that, and First and Second Maccabees deal heavily with what's going on in this time period. But for the sake of this class and our progression of Western thought, what I want to highlight in is there was this 
upsurge of what's called mystery religions taking place at this time. And in these mystery religions, we, we already have things like emperor worship under the Romans, right? Where they've gone from republic into empire and the Caesars are now declaring themselves actually like gods. Trippy. Alexander did the same thing. When he conquered Egypt, he had the Egyptian priest declare him the son of the god Ammon and who is represented by a, a ram's head. It's so interesting. So we find coins of Alexander with like a ram's horn coming off of his, his head, showing part of his divinity to the divine. Now his fellow secular humanist Greeks were just like, give it a rest, Alexander. We know where you were born. We know who your dad is. You're not the son of the god. But Alexander's like, would you like to say that again? <laughs> Differently. And so he brought a lot of that divine god king. But like I said, when the West reached India and the subcontinent, I think there was this huge um, transfer of ideas, concepts, beliefs, and I, we, we saw that with the Stoics, especially in their idea of almost like a caste system, um, reincarnation, that sort of cyclical view of history. There were other things going on though too. There was a revival of the Isis Osiris cult. And Isis was like mother goddess, fertility goddess of Egypt. Her husband's name was Osiris. And the evil god of darkness they were in conflict with was Set. And Osiris represents like the god of light, Set the god of darkness, and they were in constant battle. Sometimes Osiris would overcome Set and we would have day. Other times Set would overcome Osiris and we would have night, darkness. So it was this constant battle between light and darkness, good and evil. Well, Set kills Osiris, but Osiris is reborn through his wife, impregnating his wife Isis, basically with himself, and is reborn as Horus. Wait a minute, what? <laughs> The god impregnates the goddess and is born through her. That's just crazy talk, right? God impregnating a woman and being born of that woman. Yes, like the story of Jesus. Oh dear. And I'm gonna roll out this class for you. I mean this term. Anyone tell me what syncretism is? It's the melding of uh, different religious beliefs into like one kind of melting pot. Sure, in, in this context, yes. Yeah. So syncretism in general just means you're taking two divergent things, wavelengths, patterns, <laughs> ways of thinking, and you bring them into harmony. So they're flowing together. And you're gonna see a lot of this happening in the Mediterranean world, especially with the rise of Christianity, where it begins to syncretize with these pagan pre-Christian religions. And one of the biggies at this time was the devotees of Isis. So when Christianity, Christianity is actually an outlaw, illegal religion, I believe from the time of Hadrian, all the way, which we have the destruction of Jerusalem at 70 AD, and once again, I believe in 143, Titus comes in and lit, just scatters the Jews, just, um, the temple, not one stone is left standing on the other. The only thing we have today is like this, the support wall that the temple was built up on that platform. And that's like one of the holiest sites to the Jews today. But with this Isis Osiris cult, when Christianity came to power in 313, we have the Edicts of Toleration or the Edicts of Milan by Constantine the Great. And then by 380, Theodosius declares Christianity the state religion. Fascinating. It now becomes illegal to be a pagan. They would confiscate pagan temples. Um, Plato's Academy in Athens was closed. I mean, there's like an all-out war against this pre-Christian way of thinking. But these Greeks and Romans didn't want to just destroy these beautiful 
temples and sculptures and things like that. And so they simply, if you go to a Isis shrine, instead of destroying Isis and her holding the little baby Horus, why not just call her Mary and it's the little baby Jesus? And I'm not kidding. I mean, this is where we get a lot of this like Mary worship and devotion. It's the syncretism between Isis Osiris worship and then kind of fusing that with Christianity. Fascinating. It just seems like a lot of these religions or whatever people used to worship back in the day kind of have the same like base origin story. Yes. <laughs> Doesn't anybody tell them like, hey, that sounds like this? Well, I'm sure at the time, certain people had a problem with it, but the vast collective of Christendom embraced it. And that became like the official policy of the church at the time was, if you can go in and use the celebrations, the beliefs, the holidays of the cultures to spread the gospel, to spread the news of Jesus without violating our own beliefs, <coughs> then by all means do it. And so you get a lot of that syncretism taking place. But now we're so far removed from that that a lot of Christians are clueless about the syncretism that took place. Yeah. And so it can be quite shocking when other people point out, like, um, why are y'all wearing white gloves and big hats on Easter and handing out eggs and, and things like that? What does that have to do with anything? What does that have to do with Jesus, right, and the, the resurrection? But we'll get there. Um, another big one was called Mithraism, which was a favorite of Roman soldiers. Um, such a mystery religion that I don't have a lot of facts or data about it, but it definitely seems to have a tie-in on the one I really want to focus on today, which is Zoroastrianism. <coughs> later iteration of Manichaeanism. Zoroastrianism was a religion of ancient Persia. We read in Daniel, there's Daniel again, when Belshazzar, Nebuchadnezzar's grandson, decided to throw a feast, and he sent to the treasure house, and he had them bring the sacred um, utensils, goblets, plates, from the sacking of Jerusalem and Solomon's temple in Jerusalem. And they were actually toasting the gods of Babylon with the sacred vessels of Yahweh. And in the middle of this feast, if you remember, this disembodied pan starts writing into the stone wall, meaning, meaning, take all you farsen. And it said, Belshazzar was so upset, his knees were shaking and his bowels were he basically shat himself. And he's just like, half my kingdom who can ever tell me what's going on up here, right? And, and everyone's like, get Daniel. Daniel can read anything. And so they send for Daniel. And Daniel comes in, looks at the scene, and he says, oh, great king, I would be more than happy to tell you what it says. And he, it says, I'll, I'll tell you what it says in a minute. Let me explain this religion first. So in Zoroastrianism, there are, it's a dualistic religion. You have a god of light and a god of darkness. And these two gods are in perpetual conflict with one another. What's so twisted for humans, however, is the god of darkness creates our physical bodies But the God of light creates the non-tangible, like our soul, spirit, temperament. And so our bodies, human beings, are like a microcosm of this epic cosmic battle going on between these two deities. Our bodies are aligned with the God of darkness, and our souls and spirits, minds, are aligned with the God of light. And so this is, would explain that conflict within us between like our animal instincts, lusts, passions, drives, and the higher <coughs> thinkings of the mind. And what they believe will happen in Zoroastrian literature is eventually 
for human beings, a great set of cosmic scales is going to be laid out. And all your good deeds will be put in one scale, and all your bad deeds in another. And depending on which scale is heavier, that is where you will spend eternity. They believe the Ahura Mazda, the god of light, will eventually overcome the god of darkness, and then this god and all his devotees will go into the bad place. And all the people that had more good deeds will go to the good place. And those of you, I've been talking about that show, The Good Place, this is exactly what it's based on. It's not a Christian view of heaven and hell. It's not any of that. It's a Monarchian. So you open a door for someone, you get three points. You trip a, old, a blind person, you lose 50 points. Okay, so there's a point scale. Every action you do in your life, your thoughts, your intentions, the effect it has on others, all get calculated in these cosmic scales. And if you have done more naughty things than good things, you're going to the naughty or bad place. Fascinating. But this really resonates with us, right? How many of you keep like ledgers? My go-to prayer when I was a kid was the last thing I would say before I went to bed at night was, Jesus, please forgive me for all my sins. Because I wanted to go to sleep with a clean ledger so I could start the next morning. That's kind of like my Christian version of Monarchianism, where Jesus every day will wipe out my bad side of the scale, and I just get to keep the good part. That is not Christianity, people. I was very confused in my thinking. But this has had a profound effect on Islam in particular and Christianity. If you look at medieval Christianity, I can't tell you how many paintings or sculptures I've seen where like the Archangel Michael holding a pair of cosmic scales where the souls of the dead are being weighed. And the demons are pulling on the bad side, trying to make it seem heavier, and the angels are trying to give more weight to the good side, but it's all about your deeds, your workout. Have you done more good than evil? So back to Daniel. What's written on the wall isn't, I am <laughs> Yahweh, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and you've really ticked me off. He wrote, you have been weighed in the balances and found wanting. He judged him by the ancient religion of Persia, not by some Judeo-Christian construct. Is that interesting? I just think that's so interesting. You have been weighed in the balances and found wanting, and this night the kingdom will be taken from so I, I just love the way the scriptures bring out that ancient thing. There's still Zoroastrians today, and they're usually very moral people. Why wouldn't you be, right? You have to be to get to the good place. So you're really going to want to watch your life and how you're acting <coughs> and what's going on with that. So Zoroastrians, Manichaeanism. St. Augustine actually really loved this philosophy before he became a Christian. And I think it still shows even in his post-conversion. I think he brought some of that into it, but we'll see how far we get if we get to the Middle Ages today. What else do I want you to know about? So we've got the Gnostics, Monarchians, um, Isis, Osiris, Horus worship. So I think what I'd like to do now is to this is like an apologetic piece for you. I'm gonna show you this video that came out. It's been out probably at least a decade now. And it's called Zeitgeist. And Zeitgeist is German for spirit of the age. And so it's kind of a conspiracy theory movie. There's three parts. I'm just gonna show you the first part on religion. Then it goes into the, the Twin Towers in New York being hit. And then it goes into the international banking control and manipulation of world governments. But the reason they threw religion in here first is because they see religion. Remember we talked about Plato's cave? They see the religious and political leaders of this world as the ultimate shadow casters. And they are trying to convince you about this God up in the sky that's keeping score and he's gonna come back and deal with you accordingly. And so this Zeitgeist movie is going to show you some of these things I showed you and more and when you watch this, I want you to think about, kind of like an apologist, don't just take this in as a sponge, I want to know what kind of response you would give to this video. Could you pull up that blind for me? I don't know if I'll 
watch the whole, this first third is 30 minutes, but we'll probably watch 20 minutes of or so. And I'll put the link below my video in case you want to see this for yourself. reflecting people's respect and adoration for this object. And it is simple to understand why, as every morning the sun will rise, bringing vision, warmth, and security, saving man from the cold, blind, predator-filled darkness of night. Without it, the cultures understood the crops would not grow, and life on the planet would not survive. These realities make the sun the most adored object of all time. Likewise, they were also very aware of the stars. The tracking of the stars allowed them to recognize and anticipate events which occurred over long periods of time, such as eclipses and full moons. They in turn cataloged celestial groups into what we know today as constellations. This is the cross of the zodiac, one of the oldest conceptual images in human history. It reflects the sun as it figuratively passes through the 12 major constellations over the course of a year. It also reflects the 12 months of the year, the four seasons, and the solstices and equinoxes. The term zodiac relates to the fact that constellations were anthropomorphized or personified as figures or animals. In other words, the early civilizations did not just follow the sun and stars, they personified them with elaborate myths involving their movements and relationships. <clears throat> the sun, with its life-giving and saving qualities, was personified as a representative of the unseen creator or God, God's son, the light of the world, the savior of humankind. Likewise, the 12 constellations represented places of travel for God's son and were identified by names, usually representing elements of nature that happened during that period of time. For example, Aquarius, the water bearer, who brings the spring rains. This is Horus. He is the sun god of Egypt of around 3000 BC. He is the sun anthropomorphized, and his life is a series of allegorical myths involving the sun's movement in the sky. In the ancient hieroglyphics in Egypt, we know much about the soul of Messiah. For instance, Horus, being the sun or the light, had an enemy known as Set, and Set was the personification of the darkness or the night. And, metaphorically speaking, every morning Horus would win the battle against Set, while in the evening Set would conquer Horus and send him into the underworld. It is important to note that dark versus light, or good versus evil, is one of the most ubiquitous mythological dualities ever known, and is still expressed on many levels to this day. Broadly speaking, the story of Horus is as follows. Horus was born on December 25th of the Virgin Isis Mary. His birth was accompanied by a star in the east, and upon his birth he was adored by three kings. At the age of 12, he was a prodigal child teacher. And at the age of 30, he was baptized by a figure known as Anup, and thus began his ministry. Horus had 12 disciples he traveled about with, performing miracles such as healing the sick and walking on water. Horus was known by many gestural names such as the Truth, the Light, God's Anointed Son, the Good Shepherd, the Lamb of God, and many others. After being betrayed by Typhon, Horus was crucified, buried for three days, and thus resurrected. Snap. These attributes of Horus, whether original or not, seem to permeate many cultures of the world, for many other gods are found to have the same general mythological structure. Attis of Phrygia, born of the Virgin Nana on December 25th, crucified, placed in a tomb, and after three days was resurrected. Krishna of India, born of the Virgin Devaki, with a star in the east signaling his coming. He performed miracles with his disciples, and upon his death, was resurrected. Dionysus of Greece, born of a virgin on December 25th, was a traveling teacher who performed miracles such as turning water into wine. He was referred to as the King of Kings, God's only begotten son, the Alpha and Omega, and many others. And upon his death, 
he was resurrected. Mithra of Persia, born of a virgin on December 25th. He had 12 disciples and performed miracles. And upon his death, was buried for three days and thus resurrected. He was also referred to as the truth, the light, and many others. <coughs> Interestingly, the sacred day of worship of Mithra was Sunday. The fact of the matter is, there are numerous saviors from different periods from all over the world which subscribe to these general <coughs> characteristics. The question remains, why these attributes? Why the virgin birth on December 25th? Why dead for three days in the inevitable resurrection? Why 12 disciples or followers? To find out, let's examine the most recent of the solar messiahs. <laughs> Jesus Christ was born of the Virgin Mary on December 25th in Bethlehem. His birth was announced by a star in the east, which three kings or magi followed to locate and adorn the new savior. He was a child teacher of 12. At the age of 30, he was baptized by John the Baptist and thus began his ministry. Jesus had 12 disciples which he traveled about with performing miracles such as healing the sick, walking on the water, raising the dead. He was also known as the King of Kings, the Son of God, the Light of the World, the Alpha and Omega, the Lamb of God, and many, many others. After being betrayed by his disciple Judas and sold for 30 pieces of silver, he was crucified, placed in a tomb, and after three days was resurrected and ascended into heaven. First of all, the birth sequence is completely astrological. The star in the east is Sirius, the brightest star in the night sky, which, on December 24th, aligns with the three brightest stars in Orion's belt. These three bright stars in Orion's belt are called today what they were called in ancient times, the Three Kings. And the Three Kings and the brightest star, Sirius, all point to the place of the sunrise on December 25th. This is why the Three Kings follow the star in the east, in order to locate the sunrise the birth of the sun. The Virgin Mary is the constellation Virgo, also known as Virgo the Virgin. Virgo in Latin means virgin. Virgo is also referred to as the house of bread, and the representation of Virgo is a virgin holding a sheaf of wheat. This house of bread and its symbol of wheat represents August and September, the time of harvest. In turn, Bethlehem, in fact, literally translates to house of bread. Bethlehem is thus a reference to the constellation Virgo, a place in the sky, not on Earth. There is another very interesting phenomenon that occurs around December 25th, or the winter solstice. From the summer solstice to the winter solstice, the days become shorter and colder. And from the perspective of the Northern Hemisphere, the sun appears to move south and get smaller and more scarce. The shortening of the days and the expiration of the crops when approaching the winter solstice symbolized the process of death to the ancients. It was the death of the sun. And by December 22nd, the sun's demise was fully realized. For the sun, having moved south continually for six months, makes it to its lowest point in the sky. Here a curious thing occurs. The sun stops moving south, at least perceivably, for three days. And during this three-day pause, the sun resides in the vicinity of the Southern Cross, or Crux, constellation. And after this time, on December 25th, the sun moves one degree, this time north, foreshadowing longer days, warmth, and spring. And thus it was said, the sun died on the cross, was dead for three days, only to be resurrected or born again. This is why Jesus and numerous other sun gods share a crucifixion, three-day death, and resurrection concept. It is the sun's transition period before it shifts its direction back into the northern hemisphere, bringing spring and thus salvation. However, they do not celebrate the resurrection of the sun until the spring equinox, or Easter, this is because at the spring equinox, the sun officially overpowers the evil darkness, as daytime thereafter becomes longer in duration than the night, and the revitalizing conditions of spring emerge. Now, probably the most obvious of all the astrological symbolism around Jesus regards the 12 disciples. They are simply the 12 constellations of the zodiac, which Jesus, being the sun, travels about with. In fact, the number 12 is replete throughout the Bible. Coming back 
to the cross of the zodiac, the figurative life of the sun, this was not just an artistic expression or tool to track the sun's movement. It was also a pagan spiritual symbol, the shorthand of which looked like this. This is not a symbol of Christianity. It is a pagan adaptation of the cross of the zodiac. This is why Jesus in early occult art is always shown with his head on the cross. For Jesus is the sun, the sun of God, the light of the world, the risen savior who will come again as it does every morning. The glory of God who defends against the works of darkness as he is born again every morning and can be seen coming in the clouds up in heaven with his crown of thorns or sun rays. Now, of the many astrological, astronomical metaphors in the Bible, one of the most important has to do with the ages. Throughout the scriptures, there are numerous references to the age. In order to understand this, we need to be familiar with a phenomenon known as the precession of the equinoxes. The ancient Egyptians, along with cultures long before them, recognized that approximately every 2150 years, the sunrise in the morning of the spring equinox would occur in a different sign of the zodiac. This has to do with a slow, angular wobble that the Earth maintains as it rotates on its axis. It is called a precession because the constellations go backwards rather than through the normal yearly cycle. The amount of time it takes for the precession to go through all 12 signs is roughly 25,765 years. This is also called the Great Year. And ancient societies were very aware of this, and they referred to each 2150 year period as an age. From 4300 BC to 2150 BC, it was the age of Taurus, the bull. From 2150 BC to 1 AD, it was the age of Aries, the ram. And from 1 AD to 2150 AD, it is the age of Pisces, the age we are still in to this day. And in and around 2150, we will enter the new age, the age of Aquarius. Now, the Bible reflects, broadly speaking, a symbolic movement through three ages while foreshadowing a fourth. In the Old Testament, when Moses comes down Mount Sinai with the Ten Commandments, he is very upset to see his people worshiping a golden bull calf. In fact, he shattered the stone tablets and instructed his people to kill each other in order to purify themselves. Most biblical scholars will attribute this anger to the fact that the Israelites were worshiping a false idol or something to that effect. The reality is, the golden bull is Taurus the bull, and Moses represents the new age of Aries the ram. This is why Jews even today still blow the ram's horn. Moses represents the new age of Aries, and upon the new age, everyone must shed the old age. Other deities mark these transitions as well, such as Mithra, a pre-Christian god who kills the bull in the same symbology. Now Jesus is the figure who ushers in the age following Aries, the age of Pisces, or the two fish. Fish symbolism is very abundant in the New Testament. Jesus feeds 5,000 people with bread and two fish. When he begins his ministry walking along Galilee, he befriends two fishermen who follow him. And I think we've all seen the Jesus fish on the back of people's cars. Little do they know what it actually means. It is a pagan astrological symbolism for the sun's kingdom during the age of Pisces. Also, Jesus' assumed birth date is essentially the start of this age. At Luke 22.10, when Jesus is asked by his disciples where the last Passover will be, Jesus replies, Behold, when ye are entered into the city, there shall a man meet you, bearing a pitcher of water. Follow him into the house where he entereth in. This scripture is by far one of the most revealing of all the astrological references. The man bearing the pitcher of water is Aquarius, the water bearer. 
who is always pictured as a man pouring out a pitcher of water. He represents the age after Pisces, and when the Son, God's Son, leaves the age of Pisces, Jesus, it will go into the house of Aquarius, as Aquarius follows Pisces in the procession of the equinoxes. All Jesus is saying is that after the age of Pisces will come the age of Aquarius. Zeitgeist. Yeah, and like I said, I'll post the link up under my video so you can watch it, and I'm not plagiarizing it, hopefully. Hopefully I don't have the eyes and ease reversed in German. But Zeitgeist, Geist is like spirit, um, so spirit of the age. Catchy, catchy name for a thing. That will come up later when we get to Hegel and his philosophy. But baby, now you know what the age of Aquarius is all about, right? If you know, you've heard the song probably from Hair, the musical, but now you know we're going from the age of Aries into Pisces, which was the Jesus time, and then we'll go into Aquarius, the dawning of the age of Aquarius. Why do you think that all of the, like, there's so many religions that have their, like, their star, their because some of those religions actually were before Christianity. Oh, whoops. See, and that's a problem for Christians or evangelicals that want to say, oh, Satan's a great imitator, copycat. Well, they just mention Krishna in passing. But if you really want to trip your mind out, do a comparison between the life of Krishna and the life of Jesus. And Krishna was incarnated 900 years before Christ. So how do you copy something before it? That would be quite clever. <clears throat> so does anyone want to respond to that movie? How would you respond to someone who's just like, wow, Jesus is just the last of, or the most recent of many solar messiahs? Yes. Um. I think when you look at like the book of Daniel, right, and you look at like all the prophecies that were written like 700 years before Christ, granted, a lot of those religions that they talk about were before Daniel was written anyways, but to, I, I'm not sure that Daniel would have had any like knowledge of those religions before he wrote the book, right? Would, would where he was use, Daniel writing? Where was Daniel writing? Uh, Babylon. Where did the three kings from the east come from? Jerusalem? No. Our president of the school talked about it right before Christmas. And what was their profession, these kings from the east? Astrologers. Astrologers. They were looking at the constellations for the times, the seasons. Daniel would have been thoroughly educated and steeped into that culture. Fascinating. Also, we know that Jesus wasn't born on this we do. I'm pretty sure. <laughs> Why do we celebrate Jesus' birth on December 25th? Trying to keep adopted, you guys. Adopted, yeah. yeah. I mean, when they like, when the Romans made the calendar, yeah. yeah. Syncretism. <laughs> when Constantine came into power, Yule was the Celt, that's my people, like the pre Christian um, people, the Celts that lived. <clears throat> like Great Britain, Scotland, Wales, large parts of Europe. But they celebrated Yule. The Roman celebrated what was called Saturnalia. But Constantine the Great was a sun worshiper, S-U-N worshiper. And so when he converts to Christianity, it became a natural mashup to celebrate the birthday of the sun in the sky with the Son of God. And so they simply made the son's birthday the son of God's birthday in Saturnalia. And they kept a lot of the traditions. For example, mistletoe come, and evergreens come from my people, the Celts. Mistletoe is a sacred plant because you'll notice, like on the sycamores and stuff in the riverbeds, all the leaves will go away in the winter, and it basically looks like a dead tree, but you have these 
clumps of green still growing in the depths of winter, and that's the mistletoe, which is like a parasite. But the Druids saw that as like the sacred plant showing immortality, everlasting qualities, and so they would harvest it with silver sickles under full moons, and they would use it in rituals. Also, this idea of the evergreen tree showing that it doesn't fade, the leaves don't wither, it, it lives throughout the year, so it was a symbol of everlasting life. The Yuletide logs, this had to do with sympathetic <clears throat> magic because at this time of the year, the days are shorter and the sun appears to be dying, losing its strength. And so people throughout the world would make huge bonfires at this time of the year as like a type of sympathetic magic. We still do Yuletide logs, we put like fairy lights on our trees to bring light into the darkness, but this is all pagan sympathetic magic. And I'm not saying you should never celebrate Christmas or Saturnalia or anything like that again, but if you're not aware of the syncretism, you can imagine the confusion. If someone just saw that video and didn't know all this stuff, that could be really disturbing to them. And like, what's going on? The Romans, in their festivities of Saturnalia, they would actually elect a king for the day. You could also call it the fool for the day because he got to do whatever he wanted, Everyone listened to him. He, he got the best drinks, the best foods. Everyone carried him around town. But at the end of his special day, he was sacrificed for the sins of the people. And we still celebrate that today in the form of gingerbread men, where we make little men, we decorate them, we make them all fancy, and then we eat them. Right? I, I don't think the Romans were cannibals, but it was kind of like that scapegoat or that atonement that covering, like we're putting all our bad stuff on you, and so we're good for another year. Um, the Romans loved caroling during Saturnalia. They'd get drunk and naked and go around the town door to door and try to get treats and stuff from people, that sort of thing. So we still kept that today in the forms of Christmas carols, except most Christians don't get drunk and carol naked, I don't think. My dad was a fundamentalist Baptist pastor, and. Every Christmas, he would read the story of Luke about Mary and Joseph and the Annunciation and, and the birth of Jesus. And I'll never forget, I was probably in my mid-30s, and he felt I was finally mature enough. And he said, Fred, would you like to share the true meaning of Christmas with the family this year? And I was like, the true meaning? And he's like, yes, Fred, the true meaning. And I was like, okay. And so I just... <laughs> went into all this Saturday <laughs> and gender red man and I never got to do Christmas again. I don't know how That's how I raise my kids. I teach them both. I teach them, we're doing this because we're from this people group. These are the traditions of our ancestors. It's just kind of keeping these ancestral memories alive. But I don't want them to confuse it with the gospel or with the actual human person, Jesus of, of Nazareth. And so... I try to teach both, and I don't know if that's the right way to do it or not. I mean, I met plenty of people, right, where, oh, we're Christians, we don't celebrate Christmas or Halloween or Easter, that sort of thing, or even birthdays, maybe, because we want it all to go to God. But our culture is so pagan at its roots, even in our common speech, we mention the names of pagan deities all the time. If you were raised Hebrew in, in that theocratic sort of God-centric culture, even your days of the week were like first day of creation, second day of creation, all the way to the day of rest, right? And those became how you were supposed to live and conduct your cycles of life. And when you look at their holidays, they usually had to do with some act of God's redemption. You know, whether it's um, Passover or Feast of Tabernacle or Feast of Lights or these sorts of things where you're celebrating some deliverance of God. Think about the pre-Jewish or pre-Christian rituals and the names of the week, right? Monday, the day of the sun, right? Tuesday, who knows what Tuesday's from? I don't remember. Wednesday, Miracles, is that Mars? Mercury, Mercury the god Mercury. Um, Thursday's Thursday, Friday's for Frida, um, Saturday for Saturn, and Sunday for the day of the sun. And how curious um, Christians began, after Constantine in particular, Witten and I have had a, this running debate about this, 
I, I believe it's primarily after Constantine, Christians begin not to worship like the Jews on Friday sunset to Saturday sunset, which is the Sabbath, but they begin to use Sunday, the day of the sun, as a day of worship. Fascinating. And that's why you get Seventh-day Adventists, even to this day, saying, can't you see the syncretism? Come back, come back, you're drifting too far from shore. And that's part of where you get these sorts of things. Samhain. Um, <coughs> oh, I didn't spell that right. That's how you pronounce it. It's actually spelled, it looks like Samhain. I think that's right. But it's pronounced Samhain. And this is what our culture celebrates as Halloween. Um, Dia de los Muertos, the Oban Festival in Japan, the Day of the Dead is another one of those things celebrated around the world. And October 31st was the Celtic New Year, where they believed the veil between the physical world and the spiritual world was the thinnest, and so spirits of the dead could pass back and forth, and you might even be sucked over onto the other side. And so what they would do is, people would generally go home, they would try to put scary things, remember um, pumpkins and squash, that's a, or pumpkins at least, that's a new world um, <coughs> fruit, or vegetable fruit, was grown off a vine. They had turnips, and so they would carve turnips with scary faces and things like that to try to ward off like, Uncle Bob, we don't <laughs> want you hanging around, okay? It's creeping us out. And then if scaring them off didn't work, they would leave offerings or gifts. So that's where you get your trick or treat sort of thing. And I'm just assuming somewhere along the way, some kids, some very brave, bold kids were just like, you know what? If we dress up and go door to door, we could make a killing on, on Samhain. Right? But you have to deal with all the dead roaming around. The Catholic Church basically baptizes this holiday and calls it All Hallows Eve or All Saints Day. And so once again, you get that syncretism between the two. And the last one I'm gonna talk about is Easter. The Eastern Orthodox Church won't even call it Easter because Easter is the derivation of Ishtar. One of my buddies always calls it like Ishtar eggs and, and that sort of thing. And rabbits, eggs, what does that have to do with the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus? Nothing. It has to do with fertility and maypoles and making babies and the rites of spring and passage. And we see these goddesses throughout the ancient Greek world. I just learned some really interesting stuff about Artemis, um, especially in the context of Ephesus and 1 Corinthians, the mother goddess who the female came first and then she created male. So it's different from the Genesis account. It like flips the Genesis account on its head where you have the mother goddess and it's man that brought sin into the world, not the woman. And so men are seen as suspect. Fertility, rituals, etc. Resurrection Sunday is the preferred orthodox. Okay. Questions, comments on this sort of thing? Uh, the whole thing about the deity being crucified, what, wasn't crucifixion originally like a Roman idea? Or was there crucifixion before the Romans were around? First of all, if you fact check that video, a lot of that they were just completely making up. Yeah. Or another thing that happens is a lot of those ancient religions actually s syncretize with Christianity. Mm -hmm. Because Christianity had such a great story, they incorporated it back into their older myths, like Dionysius. I don't believe there's any account of the crucifixion and resurrection of him yeah. pre-Christian. And then we start seeing it show up in the literature. And so it works both ways. You get the pagan influence into Christianity, but then you have the backflow back into paganism. And so the syncretism is affecting both ways. And that would be my challenge to you is, can you discern or distinguish what is pure Christianity or the gospel from its cultural accretions? Like what's been added on? And, and think about how Christianity has rolled over the years. That early Christianity was like an imperial Roman Christianity. So it took on the culture of the Greeks and Romans. That's part of why Christianity today is dualistic. It's coming out of that Gnostic dualistic. Matter <clears throat> is evil, spirit is good. 
that sort of thing has permeated. Even the Monarchian stuff has permeated how a lot of Christians think. Think in your own thought process. If you've been, like, if you were really naughty last weekend, you might be thinking, I gotta do my daily devotions and maybe go to a midweek Bible study because I just feel dirty and maybe I need to give a little more in the offering plate. Or it could work the other way. Maybe you went on a missions trip this summer and you feel like you banked some serious good points and now you can cruise a little while, right? Because you, you've invested and now you're going to just relax, take a holiday, take a little hedonistic holiday. But that's, that's part of our thinking. And so if you get into that sort of weighing these good and bad deeds, if you're doing these syncretisms, and don't get me wrong, I don't care if you have a Christmas tree and fairy lights and you're making gingerbread men and all that, but if you can't separate the differences between the cultures of these religions and, and what is the light of the gospel or God's work in the world, that's going to be very problematic. And then it just becomes this mishmash or hodgepodge of different religious beliefs. Other questions, comments about this? Do you guys have any personal thoughts or convictions about holidays? I mean, is this new information to you? Is this, you've heard this stuff before, but... And, and think about it, if you have kids, or how are you going to raise them? Are, are you going to have certain guidelines, or is it just, you know, whatever the culture's doing at the time? Well, I mean, why do you feel as though it's like, so a lot of these holidays are commercialized. Yeah. Do you, I mean, I'm, I'm asking you, like, do you... That's, like, for instance, like... That's, that's the like, real American religion, right? <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like, like the holidays like Valentine's Day and stuff like that. It's obviously, to make money. Saint Valentine's I mean, it's... Because I feel like Christmas is pretty much, like, the whole Christmas season is pretty much as soon as November starts. And it's just Christmas sale, Christmas sale. Yeah, I want to finish day. my turkey carcass soup before I see Christmas stuff. But uh, it ain't course, that's, that's not the case. Yeah, that's no. not the case anymore. <clears throat> it, it, this is my personal amusement, and you can do with it what you want. But every year when we get to put Christ back into Christmas or take Christianity back, I'm just like, Christians stole it in the first place. <laughs> And now you're mad because the world took it back. Mm -hmm. And it was actually Christian um, corporations, Macy's and others, that commercialized it. Right. Like our St. Nicholas into Coca-Cola gives us our American version of Santa Claus, right? Mm -hmm. He's even wearing the white and red Coca-Cola colors. It was to sell Coke. Wow. And yet, you know, if you go to England or something, if you saw Chronicles of Narnia, they have Father Christmas, right? Mm -hmm. Who's much more like a druid Yule priest who's been seeing the light or the goodness, right? But there's ways to use this as well. Like St. Patrick, when he went to Ireland, he was a Briton who wanted to convert the, the Irish. And he dressed like the Druids dressed, the nature priest. And he spoke to them about, in fact, he presented Christ as an arch Druid, the Lord of the wind and the waves, the creator of the trees, of the animals, of human beings. And he was all in, and he would challenge these nature priests to feats of faith or strength. And he'd say, let's build the Yule Tide fire, and let's pass through it together and see who comes out the other side. But none of the Druids wanted to go through the fire with Patrick, because they thought he was crazy. <laughs> but that made a huge impression on the Irish chieftains and that sort of thing. And it was interesting talking to the Zambia guys that were here and Mark, the guy that was traveling with them, they were talking about how you want to target the headmen of these tribes because if you convert the headmen, the tribe will follow. It, think, though, from an American perspective how weird that sounds. It's like that group think, right, where we're taught all the time, no, think for yourself, be an individual, don't just go along with what the group's saying. But in these tribal cultures, it was a group thing, very much so. And so I'm not saying that individual tribe members didn't genuinely believe it, but it often took like this tipping point, and when a, a head or someone of authority <coughs> went over, it was much easier for the other people. I mean, we could talk about individual versus group salvation later, 
but I just think that's an interesting phenomena you find in these these traditions. We're actually seeing a revival of a lot of, I would call it like neo-paganism, what we see in the forms of like Wicca or other things. This isn't Satanism, this is like the pre-Christian tribal religions of Europe. A lot of it's tied in with like Native American religions, those sorts of things. It's easy to see when other cultures are doing it, it's harder to see how we've done it. Any other questions, comments about this? All right, I got about 10, 15 minutes. I, I wanna talk a little bit more about going back to the Gnosticism because I see it all around us in society and the church today, especially in Christianity. And it has to do, if, if you remember, I'm gonna, I won't erase here. If you remember the great chain of being, So we talked about this idea that here we have spirit, which equals good, and then we have matter, which is evil, and here we have poor humans who have this spirit, soul piece, trapped in this body or physical piece. What the Gnostics were promising was, if you come in and you learn their teachings, you gnosis, which was Greek for knowledge. And so what they're trying to do is to tell you, it's kind of like, we see its effect even in things like the Shriners or the Masons or things like that, where as you enter into these organizations, they give you more information and you like level up. As you get more information, more knowledge, more accomplishments, you keep getting brought higher and higher into the system until you just have these few that contain all this esoteric or deep transformative knowledge. And their idea is if you come and join us and learn from us, it's literally like climbing a stairway or a ladder And we see this, a lot of this happens, for example, at St. Catherine's Monastery, we had this guy named <coughs> Abbot Johannes Climacus, which literally is like John the Ladder Climacus. He wrote a book called the, the Ladder of Divine Ascent. Did I show you this already? No. I get confused with all my classes. This, this, this definitely comes up in ethics as well. Translation among many mistranslations. The actual word being used is eon, which means age. I will be with you even to the end of the age, which is true.
Yes. So I actually got to see this. Um, so the higher you go, the more illuminated you become? Yes. So I actually got to see this painting at the Getty. They did a, a tour. And so here you have this ladder of divine ascent, and each rung represented like a different vice to overcome or virtue to accomplish. So this might be overcoming lust, overcoming pride, overcoming anger, overcoming selfishness. And then these might be being truthful, being giving, being joyful, like the fruit of the spirit, these sorts of things. So you have your do rungs and your don't rungs. And here's Johannes Climacus. He's almost there. Here's Jesus. He's like, you're almost there, buddy. You can do it. <laughs> and then the saints down here are praying you up. And the saints above are praying you up. But the evil one and his minions are trying to pull you off. And that's through temptation, vice, those sorts of things. And then if you, if you fall off, game over, you're going to the bad place. <laughs> but if you persevere, you get to be here. People, this is not Christianity. This is Monarchianism. This is that ladder climbing Gnostic sort of thing. And the way you can tell, like I said, biggest red flag to me is once they start saying spiritual things are good, physical things are evil. That should be your first clue you're entering Gnostic land. Doesn't seem like anybody makes a cross though. Not many. Who's the guy in front of me? Probably some humble saint that yeah. keeps his mouth shut, just <laughs> obeys God and loves his fellow man. <laughs> He's not wearing his his white silk <clears throat> robe, yeah, that gold embroidery. Yeah. I just like, see what the heck? I just see several people, people falling and nobody. <laughs> Yeah. There are two, you gotta focus. You can't be worried about the people ain't making it. So you gotta focus. <laughs> See, that just said, no, I was not. Anyway. Aren't are there some, like, uh, like, monasteries or whatever that you, like, climb on your knees mm -hmm. to get to? Like, I, I feel like that's a very much like a, you punish yourself, you punish the flesh so that you can be more spiritual kind of thing. And that is what we call asceticism. And asceticism has this view of the human, a spiritual man or woman, would be someone who has starved the flesh and fed and nurtured the spirit. The carnal man or woman <coughs> is someone who has starved the spirit so it's anemic, it can't even fight the flesh anymore, and they have fed the flesh. How do you feed the flesh? By doing all the bad stuff. <laughs> but what's bad stuff? Yeah, you drink and be merry, that's feeding the flesh. Anything that's fun. Anything <laughs> that feels good to the senses is feeding the flesh. The way you feed the spirit is like psalms, hymns, philosophy, theology, right? The dry stuff from Heraclitus. That's soul drying purification. I've even heard this in our own chapels. The, the old saying about inside each of us are two dogs or two wolves. A black one and a white one. A good one and an evil one, right? It's that whole good and evil scenario. That dualism again. And then the response is like, well, which dog or which wolf is going to win? And the answer is always the one you feed. That's the one that's going to win. But do you see the Gnosticism there? It's, it's where you see in the little cartoons where you got like a, an angel on one shoulder and a demon on the other, and they're both vying for your affections and your loyalty. That's Gnostic dualism. This is not Christianity. But see, it appeals to the flesh because we get to feel good about ladder climbing, <coughs> or feeling so spiritual. When you take ethics with me, I don't know if I have time to get into this right now, part of the problem is what people think flesh is. What is the flesh? Do you guys know enough Greek for, we have different words in Greek. 
So we have the Greek word soma, which can mean body, but we also have the Greek word sarx, which is often translated flesh. But depending on the context, sarx can mean your physical material body, muscle, bone, tissue, or it could mean the appetites that come from having a body, like the desire for rest, shelter, comfort, sexual gratification, those sorts of things would be appetites that come from having a physical body. Doesn't mean the appetites are wrong or evil, but they're there because you have a body. If we start saying either of these equals evil, we run into huge problems because I believe Romans 8.3 tells us Christ came in the sarks, in the flesh. And that's when I was saying about the gospel according to Judas, those Christological heresies we had in the early church were often around this idea of Christ was either had to be fully God because if he had any humanity, he would be tainted, he wouldn't be perfect, or he was a physical human that this perfect spirit of God kind of like possessed, but then left upon crucifixion. And so, but both of those are in grave error, at least from my understanding of the scripture, where the scriptures teach us about the God man, right? the soul and spirit. We still see this in Christianity today, but it's this idea that through my will, through my efforts, through the strength of my self-discipline and self-control, I can suppress these appetites I have, and then the spirit can be more powerful within me. As opposed to these people where they are slaves to the flesh because it consumes them. They're constantly thinking about how can I gratify these appetites I have, these desires. And so they are carnally minded, not spiritually minded. And then later, LaHaye and others, in his book like Spirit Controlled Temperament, they would basically be like, this is like the throne room of your heart. And the question is, who's sitting on the throne? In, in this scenario, self is sitting on the throne. And even if you are a Christian, Jesus is not in control. But the spirit-led life has Jesus sitting on the throne, and the self is subordinate. But still, these are problematic in this dualistic sort of thinking, this good and evil sort of thinking. And as long as you think this physical material body is actually evil, that's a problem. And so Augustine, coming out of this Monarchianism, is going to have to deal with these sorts of things. And so next class, we'll pick up after Plotinus going into, basically, I like to say the ancient period ended at, four, I think it was 457, the last Roman emperor was deposed. And so I like four, 500 to like 1500 makes a nice medieval period. So we'll talk about John Scotus Erigena, Anselm, Augustine, and Aquinas for next class.